Hi, this is Frank Labanca and Joy Erickson with the Connecticut Science Fair and Connecticut Junior Science and Humanities Symposium. And we're going to talk today a little bit about preparing a poster and your visual aids. And when we start talking about visual aids, I want to talk about the three P's. The plan, the prepare, and the present. You see there's multiple steps in making a poster, and it's not just about the poster, but it's how, or the visual aids you're making in a PowerPoint presentation, but it's really thinking about how those aids enhance the story you're going to try to tell, not only in words, not only in pictures, but in the communication aspect you yeah. would have with them. We need audience. to prepare the person as well. Yeah. Just to start, I want to just take a minute to talk about academic honesty and responsibility. And, and there are some pitfalls that students can sometimes fall into, and we want to make sure to avoid those very carefully. First, copying or cutting and pasting from another person's work without giving credit for it is highly inappropriate. And paraphrasing using other person's work, and that includes images without giving citations, that really is inappropriate too. If you give credit for your sources, you're fine. But sometimes you have sources that you need to ask permission for. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're if you need a picture of something, let's try to get it yourself, you know, or or take a picture. Digital pictures are easy to take. So I think that it's important to try to do as much of the work yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's value when student when we can see the students have created their own graphics, their own absolutely. Visuals. Sometimes we don't have those accessibilities. So just make sure you credit for those pieces that you get. And when we talk about what scientific posters or scientific slides look like, you really have to think about layout and, and mounting strategies, even to the point of the fonts that you select. And, and there are two major types of fonts. You have the serif fonts, and those are fonts that have little hooks in them. And you have sans serif fonts, and those are more smooth fonts. So serif fonts, example, the big one that everyone uses is Times New Roman, and the sans serif font is Arial. Well, at a distance, the sans serif fonts actually are easier to read. So uh, you might want to consider using those. Also, the colors you select, things that look good on your screen or on your computer don't always project well on a screen or don't always translate well to a board. We see this a lot as a student's presenting. We do our oral presentations in very big halls, and when they put that um, PowerPoint on the screen and they have something in red or yellow, it just about disappears. Yeah. So you want to use those darker colors, yeah, blues, especially with your words. Yeah, blues tend to be yeah. the best. Black and white works well, but yeah, the reds and the yellows yeah, are nice. notoriously hard to see. Well, when you think about the design of your slides or your posters, what's the message? Who's your audience? What story do you want to tell? And you need to be able to adjust that message depending on the audience. So as you think about the story, you need to think about how that story flows. Where do you start? Where do you finish? And does it make visual sense in the direction you take your audience? Yeah, that's very important with posters is um, people read from one side to the other that it makes sense the way that they're reading the poster. I, I kind of like to call it the two by four approach mm -hmm. to uh, making a poster, making a presentation. If someone hits you over the head with a two by four, you, you know it happened. You know you that know? it's there. And, yeah. and it's very obvious. So, and that's really when you create a presentation and visual aids, you want to make sure that it's just so obvious that it happened, no one could miss it. They're not trying to search for things in different locations. Even yeah. if you think a poster of a lot's not so big. It is. It's, yeah, it's, it is. it's a large landscape, potentially, to share information. So you don't want to confuse people. You want them to be able to look at your story. Your judges have to come, but we also have other participants that want to see it. So you want to catch them. So you're almost in a, you're kind of competing for people's time as well. Yeah, that's very true. And, you know, when you try to sell your ideas, the first thing you start with is a title. And titles should be able to stand alone. They should be able to communicate the project well. Right. And to your audience, again, if we think about who that audience is, practicing scientists, practicing engineers, they are striving to have you do the things that they do when they go to scientific meetings. Mm -hmm. And so cutesy titles, like the ones you, you might be seeing on the screen right now, they, they are not well respected yes. by the scientific community. You want to have a descriptive title that really shares what you're doing. But not something so complicated that most people can't pronounce yeah. it. You have to have access, though. It's that balance yes. of of real science and yet accessible to a large audience. Right. 
I think it should be descriptive in some sense, and they, they should definitely communicate what the title is trying to share within the whole project. And right now on your screen, you can take a look at some titles that, that existed from the Connecticut Science Fair from some years ago. But if you look at these titles, uh, these, this was from a set of projects that were all actually side by side right. in the right. fair. So there were posters that were all next to each other. They, these were senior high school physical science projects. Mm -hmm. And just take a look at some of the titles. And you know, you can almost predict the quality of the project just by looking at the title. Just by looking at the title. And you can also predict what a judge might think. It's kind of like when people, when you look at a person and how they're dressed, what they look like, your mind just automatically makes some assumptions and makes some conclusions. So first impressions of your title are really important. Much more important than we might have originally thought. I love this um, activity that you have here, Frank, because it really shows us that you know, we don't know anything about these but their titles, yet we were usually able to predict in a big room which ones were going to win. Right. So if you look at those titles at the Connecticut Science Fair, projects are basically initially grouped to the top third, the middle third, and, and the bottom third. Now, what I'll do is I'll share with you now the, the award sequence that went with these, which were in the top third, they're going to be number one. Which were in the middle third, number twos, and and number threes at the bottom third. So if you haven't taken some time, please pause the, the tape and, and take a look. And uh, right now I'll reveal what those were. Very revealing. And if you would look at some of the third, that idea about being cutesy or being too short, those are in the bottom. All right. And, and you can also kind of, the, so the titles also reveal some of what the students right. have done and the quality associated mm -hmm. with that work. Because think about this, especially if you're trying to be like a real scientist, um, when, when we real scientists make a title for our paper, what we are thinking is people are going to be searching these abstracts and these titles. When I search for a paper, I want it to be relevant to the research that I'm doing. I look at the title first to decide, do I want to even look at this abstract? Is this going to help me? So I'm trying to reach out to my colleagues when I come up with a title so that they will know this is going to tell me what I need to know. This is going to bring me further into what I need to know. And we don't do cutesy titles in real science because it has a function in our, in our world. It makes so that people will click on our abstract and then it's the more you're cited the better it is for you too as a scientist it means what you're doing makes a difference to other people right and following that idea you know i think it's so important to just state what your purpose of research is and that should be short it shouldn't be elaborate really again that with that two by four approach mm -hmm. you know, what does what does it look like give me a summary of your work in a sentence maybe two and then that abstract maybe that 150 to 250 word summary of the project. What did you do? How did you do it? What were the results and what do those results mean? Right. And Just it's important to say what the results were and what did they mean. But being very concise, so you really have to pull out what is the most important thing. Right. And how can you tell your story in a very short amount of words. So this is another thing to have people look at as well to say, you know, you don't know anything about my project. Do you get it if you read this abstract, or are you totally lost? One of the things, too, at least for me, when I, when I write abstracts, is I like to write my abstract, even though it's going to appear at the beginning of the poster, when I'm done. Mm -hmm. Because then I make sure all my ideas have, have come together. It's really this is my job to summarize my work in a short, concise way. And it helps with your story as well. Um, because if you're when you finish your poster and you have your abstract, you can check back as well and have someone else do the same. Then I'm going to move on. We want to think about some introductory material. Mm -hmm. you know, and the point of introductory material is to frame the conversation. Why did you choose the work you did? Mm -hmm. What previous work was done that sets your audience up to say, of course, it makes total sense mm -hmm. that this project was done. It fits within the scope of the larger scientific work around what you're working on.
Because it's important to connect to the big picture, to connect to people in their everyday lives. Why would this be important? Um, you know, some of the research that, that I've done, oftentimes a student will be doing their little project and they'll be working with their molecules in, in the lab, but the bigger reason we're doing it might be because it's an antioxidant and it might help people in their lives not to get cancer so often and that's why you're doing what you're doing. But a lot of times students will get lost in that petri dish and they will not connect it to the outside. Like the most important thing is where the molecules go. But that really isn't. It's really how does it engage with other people? Why is it important to humanity? I just make those connections. It's mm -hmm. so important to make connections beyond what your project is. Where does your project fit in in the, in the bigger scheme of things? Absolutely. And uh, you might share some materials and methods. Sometimes that is separate. Yep. Sometimes it's not separate. You know, it comes to how do you want to present your data. Sometimes it's easy to tell the materials and methods within data. Right. Sometimes it's not. Those are choices you'll have have to make. Yeah, you have to think about it. Is um, is this something that's pretty common that most people would know about? And you might not know whether a lot of people know about it. That's why it's important to share things because you don't want to go into every single detail, um, especially. Yeah. Like, not everyone needs to know that to one sample you added two milliliters of water to, to do something. Exactly. Those little finite details, yeah. may, if it is critical, share it. But if it's not a critical aspect, if it is save a, it back. A, a procedure that has been published over and over, it may be new to you, but it might not be new to your audience, or it might not be important. You don't want to get um, lost in the details. Right. And uh, when you think of your data and your analysis, what do you want to share? And I think visuals are so important in, in this avenue. What did you do? How did you analyze them? And what do they look like? Because the pictures really are everything that's important. critical. They need to be simple. If they're not yours, you need to cite them. And they need to be able to explain the trends. I think mm -hmm. sometimes students get lost in, in data that they're not showing trends in the data, summary right. of what your results mean. What do you think of pictures of the student actually doing the project? Is that an important thing to put on a poster? I'm throwing them a curve. Yeah, I, I, it, you know, that's a, it's a great question and, and you use the standard answer. Well, it depends. It depends. If you're doing something that your audience is not going to really know, I, I use an ICP to do mm -hmm. some inductively coupled plasma to do some analysis, someone might not know what that means. Yeah. And a picture of you at that apparatus mm -hmm. might be helpful. Or if you were working in the field, yep. doing some field work. If so that they know that you didn't get that data off of a database, that you were actually taking those. Right. Yeah, but it also connects you to, oh, not everyone's been to Long Island Sound. Yeah. And if someone sees what a salt marsh in Long Island Sound looks like, for example, and you're in it, that's, 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 that's fine. Okay. Or if it's just a picture of that area, too, that, that's good, too. So uh, when you think about your data, you're probably going to consider including tables and uh, graphs and figures. Mm -hmm. Tables tend to report data, and graphs summarize and interpret the trends. Those are not mutually exclusive from one another, but I think you want to think about how you want to visually present the data. So I'm going to share with you an example right now. So this is a student that collected fish at a, uh, at a marsh mm -hmm. in Long Island Sound, and he collected uh, 65, 70 fish or so, and he took these fish and determined their mass in grams, and then he also took their length in millimeters. So two pieces of information. And if we look at the graphs, you know, they're well labeled. There's a, there's a title on them. We're identifying which fish is there, the mass in grams, and, and fish number and our, or length. They're all accurately represented. However, if you look at that, that doesn't really has really a... Doesn't tell me anything. So what? Yeah. What's the big deal with There's that? There's a little bit of variation. You oh, know? oh, 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 I did a lot of data collection. Yeah. Okay. But it doesn't really go into that next step. What's the deeper thought associated with it? Well, the first thing I would want to know just by looking at that is, well, what's the relationship between the, way the mass know. and the length? And, and if we look at the next picture, well, now that... Now you see a trend. Now I see the trend. Yep. And we've done more in this. Now we've put a regression line in, a power regression in. We've gotten the equation of that power regression as a potential predictor of, of what might be happening. See, that tells a story, Absolutely. that shows some thought, where the others are just reporting the information for the sake of reporting it. 
Right, so that's important if you're going to make a, a graph or have something that it be a significant, something that somebody has an aha, aha I see where this trend is going. Right. When you think about your conclusions, obviously you want to summarize your work, make them simple but clear. You might want to consider bulleting conclusions. It makes it, again, that, that approach of it's very direct. You might want to do more elaborate. Those are choices you have to make. I think it's important, though, to consider error analysis. What are your sources of error? And also, what's the limitations That's to the really work you important. do? That's really The limitations, it, you need to acknowledge those. Because it, and, and it's okay to have limitations. And I think a lot of kids feel limitations might weaken their proposal, their, not proposal, but their project. But I think it strengthens it because you're being very honest about what's happening. I think, you know, we go back to, to those authentic people who are going to evaluate you. They know their work has limitations. Absolutely. They would expect you to, to have the same mm -hmm. limitations. And uh, I have always encouraged my students when I've worked with them to actually have dedicated space to limitations. Put it out there in front. Don't be mm -hmm. shy to say. It shows you really have thought about your problem in a meaningful way. And I think it's very important. And then in terms of references, yeah. I think on a poster, those those are very valuable if someone wants to look. You might have a binder of work that shares some of those references. Sometimes they appear on oral presentation slides, but I've never seen a student do anything but really click through them really quick. Right, just to say they're there. They're just you know, to say, like, I didn't do this all by myself. Here are my references. But when you have a poster, you have that book there, and the references are there. So I think those are valuable, too. I think when you think about now presenting this information, you want to practice and prepare. You want to practice for anyone who would listen. Mm -hmm. Practice setting it up. Make sure you can introduce if you're doing a poster. That's right. In two or three minutes if you're doing an oral presentation. It's going to be 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's a different time frame to share your work. You can't share everything when you do you this. You can't. It, it's kind of like um, we have a, a saying here, an elevator pitch. You only have two to four minutes, just the elevator ride, to get everything out that you need to get out, to sell your project, to make sure you're hitting those very important points. Right. So I make sure you have your materials. Mm -hmm. Never hurts to have a, a little glue or, or some yeah. thumbtacks or some scotch tape, just in case. Be prepared. A lot of posters these days are one know, pieces. One piece, which makes it easier in many respects because it's one piece, but then it doesn't give you that flexibility of moving things around a little bit and seeing which pictures w really would fit. Um, so you kind of have to do that on the computer, which makes it right. a little trickier. And you don't want to print all those things because it's expensive. So The other thing to think about too, just in terms of your uh, posters, this is just more of a mechanical thing than anything else. At the Kinetic Science Fair, you in engineering career, you do not put your name on your posters. But at JSHS, you put your name on your posters. So if you are going to be using this poster in two locations, you know, just have it removable. Yeah, have, have something where you can remove that uh, as well. And then just in terms, you've done some great work, I'm sure. So be enthusiastic about it. Smile. You know, um, connect with people. Eyes connect. You know, the smile connects. People want to know why you're excited about your work, and you should yeah. be excited. That is just as important as sharing the actual work. And then when you think in terms of answering questions, really the meat of your evaluation will come down to how you answer questions. Absolutely. And having material, that logbook next to you, can have things that just didn't fit on your poster if someone asks about the background. I'm sure you can bring more information yeah. to the discussion. And, and be honest in your question answering. Know what your limitations are in the work you've done and know what you know about your project, share what you know, and it's okay that you don't know everything. It's important to stay in known territory so that you don't overstate yourself and say something that isn't actually in your research. Um, what about apparatus? We cannot have apparatus. It really, that's a, it depends, check the rules. Yeah, be very careful about what you bring and the safety of what yeah. you bring. And that goes back to that picture question mm -hmm. you brought up earlier. Sometimes yep. a picture is just as valuable as having the apparatus present. Absolutely. Sometimes it doesn't do the job. Yep. So check your rules and safety guidelines to see what is appropriate to bring. And if you have a question, don't be afraid to ask the, the organizations because they're more than happy to provide you with that feedback ahead of time as well. Absolutely. Well, this has been a talk about posters and, and preparing visual aids, both for posters and oral presentations. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you at the fair and at the symposium. Thank you.